The Art of Living, Part 1. Deem no man in any age gentle for his lineage. Though he be not highly born, he is gentle if he doth what longeth to a gentleman. Chaucer. Everyone is the son of his own work. Cervantes. Serve a noble disposition, though poor. The time comes that he will repay thee. George Herbert. Although men are accused for not knowing their own weakness, yet perhaps as few know their own strength, it is in men as in soils, where sometimes there is a vein of gold which the owner knows not of. Swift. Let not what I cannot have my cheer of mind destroy. Sibber. The art of living deserves a place among the fine arts. Like literature, it may be ranked with the humanities. It is the art of turning the means of living to the best account, of making the best of everything. It is the art of extracting from life its highest enjoyment, and, through it, of reaching its highest results. To live happily, the exercise of no small degree of art is required. Like poetry and painting, the art of living comes chiefly by nature, but all can cultivate and develop it. It can be fostered by parents and teachers, and perfected by self-culture. Without intelligence, it cannot exist. Happiness is not like a large and beautiful gem, so uncommon and rare, that all search for it is vain, all efforts to obtain it hopeless. But it consists of a series of smaller and commoner gems, grouped and set together, forming a pleasing and graceful whole. Happiness consists in the enjoyment of little pleasures scattered along the common path of life, which, in the eager search for some great and exciting joy, we are apt to overlook. It finds delight in the performance of common duties, faithfully and honorably fulfilled. The art of living is abundantly exemplified in actual life. Take two men of equal means, one of whom knows the art of living and the other not. The one has the seeing eye and the intelligent mind. Nature is ever new to him and full of beauty. He can live in the present, rehearse the past, or anticipate the glory of the future. With him, life has a deep meaning and requires the performance of duties which are satisfactory to his conscience and are therefore pleasurable. He improves himself, acts upon his age, helps to elevate the depressed classes, and is active in every good work. His hand is never tired, his mind is never weary. He goes through life joyfully, helping others to its enjoyment. Intelligence, ever expanding, gives him every day fresh insight into men and things. He lays down his life full of honor and blessing, and his greatest monument is the good deeds he has done and the beneficent example he has set before his fellow creatures. The other has comparatively little pleasure in life. He has scarcely reached manhood ere he has exhausted its enjoyments. Money has done everything that it could for him, yet he feels life to be vacant and cheerless. Traveling does him no good, for, for him, history has no meaning. He is only alive to the impositions of innkeepers and couriers, and the disagreeableness of traveling for days amidst great mountains, among peasants and sheep, cramped up in a carriage. Picture galleries he feels to be a bore, and he looks into them because other people do. These pleasures soon tire him, and he becomes blasé. When he grows old, and has run the round of fashionable dissipations, and there is nothing left which he can relish, life becomes a masquerade, in which he recognizes only knaves, hypocrites, and flatterers. Though he does not enjoy life, yet he is terrified to leave it. Then the curtain falls. With all his wealth, life has been to him a failure, for he has not known the art of living, without which life cannot be enjoyed. It is not wealth that gives the true zest to life, but reflection, appreciation, taste, culture. Above all, the seeing eye and the feeling heart are indispensable. With these, the humblest lot may be made blessed. Labor and toil may be associated with the highest thoughts and the purest tastes. The lot of labor may thus become elevated and ennobled. Montaigne observes, that all moral philosophy is as applicable to a vulgar and private life as to the most splendid. Every man carries the entire form of the human condition within him. 
Even in material comfort, good taste is a real economist, as well as an enhancer of joy. Scarcely have you passed the doorstep of your friend's house when you can detect whether taste presides within it or not. There is an air of neatness, order, arrangement, grace, and refinement that gives a thrill of pleasure, though you cannot define it or explain how it is. There is a flower in the window or a picture against the wall that marks the home of taste. A bird sings at the windowsill, books lie about, and the furniture, though common, is tidy, suitable, and, it may be, even elegant. The art of living extends to all the economies of the household. It selects wholesome food and serves it with taste. There is no profusion. The fare may be very humble, but it has a savor about it. Everything is so clean and neat, the water so sparkles in the glass, that you do not desire richer viands or a more exciting beverage. Look into another house, and you will see profusion enough without either taste or order. The expenditure is larger, and yet you do not feel at home there.